Hi, my name is Shira Chess, and thank you to Imagining Futures for inviting me here today. My presentation is How to Play Like a Feminist, Why Feminists Need Video Games and Why Video Games Need Feminism. I was invited here today because I wrote a book which came out late last year, and the book that I wrote, Play Like a Feminist, was meant to be a provocation. I wrote it in 2018 and 2019 in response to the impending feelings of doom that I had when I thought about the world around me. And as it happens, the world is still pretty messy in 20, it continued to be messy in 2020, and surprise, it's still messy even in 2021. I don't pretend that my book has an answer to all of the things, but I've come here today to ask you to think a little bit less about impending doom and a little bit more about play. It's a book about why we need to think differently about video games, but it isn't just about video games, and it's a book a proposing that play should be a core issue of equality and of feminism. My goal was, and it still is, that I wanted to write something positive that gave a sense of hope to both myself and to others. Because as Roxane Gay says, let us try to become the feminists that we would like to see moving through the world. And that's what this project was to me. The idea was that the feminism that I wanted to see, the one that I wanted to try and use to affect change, was one that fully embraced uh, play in many aspects, through rethinking the value of leisure, to getting more people to play video games, to changing how we think about activism and protest. I'm not here to tell you that video games will um, miraculously fix everything around us. That would be absurd. But I'm saying that by thinking about the importance of games and of leisure equality, we can take a small step towards improving our own lives and the lives of those around us. At the same time, we can help to improve an industry that has long been stuck in a space between innovation and stagnation, ping-ponging between the two at regular intervals. And to that end, I use the phrase play like a feminist throughout my book as a call to action. And here's what I mean by it. I see playing like a feminist as a disruptive and inclusive practice. We play like a feminist to both, both improve lives and think about protests differently. We play like a feminist when we retool the pleasures of play, creating opportunities for players to experiment with identity and agency. We play like a feminist when we apply intersectional approaches to leisure disparities and help find playful opportunities for others. We play like feminists when our play isn't just about white, male, cisgendered, young, straight, able, dexterous players. It's about play that aligns itself with a larger cause of leisurely freedom. And we play like a feminist when we transform video game culture, forging a space within it for new kinds of games and gamers. We play like a feminist when we weave all of these measures together to engage in radical play. And just to clarify, when I wrote my book, I was speaking to you. Yes, you watching this with your eyebrows raised on the other side of that screen. You who don't think of yourself as a gamer. Hey, you who plays best fiends and words with friends on your phone. I'm talking to you because the video game industry is a hot mess. And I'm talking to you because even though you don't think that you have any say, you get to be part of this conversation about what games get to look like and how they can be important. You get to be part of this community figuring out the content of a mass media. In my book, I argue that if we play more, think better about play, and strategize play into our everyday lives, in part through video games, we can be better feminists, better allies, and at the same time, make better games. To that end, my talk today is going to break down two major ideas. First, why video feminists need video games, and second, why video games need feminisms. So let's start with the first premise that I'd like to convince you of today, that feminists need video games. Now, it's not my goal here today to spend a lot of time convincing you of the import of feminism. There are a lot of people who can do that more effectively than I can. And I'm going to assume that if you came to this talk, you're at least marginally on board with the notion of why feminism is important. But just in case there's any ambiguity, let me say that the definition of feminism that I embrace in my work is from Bell Hooks, who wrote that feminism, quote, is a movement to end sexism, sex ex exploitation, and oppression. Feminism is not a movement about excluding men, but about equality for all. Feminism is not only for white folks, and it's not only for middle class people, and it's not only for cisgendered people. Okay, now that we've gotten that settled, let's talk about why feminists need video games. And to do this, we're going to backtrack a little bit and give you a bit of context. My context starts with another book that I wrote, this one published in 2017 called Ready Player Two. 
Ready Player Two was a more traditionally academic book, and in it I studied specifically how video games are designed for and marketed to an idealized feminine audience. In the book, I talk a lot about games that not a ton of other people have talked about. Games like Kim Kardashian Hollywood and Diner Dash and an endless number of match three uh, games and bubble shooters and hidden object games. Ready Player Two was meant as a response to game culture and game academics who often narrowly focus on what are referred to often as hardcore and triple A games and in deference to masculine geek culture. And within this, there's a tacit understanding about who belongs in gamer culture. And to shorthand it, we've been led to believe that a typical gamer looks like this, not like this. And that good games, productive games, games that benefit the industry and the overstated vision of the gamer should look like this, not like this. But that's not the reality. Games and gamers look like a lot of different things. And in fact, roughly half of all gamers identify as female. This is complicated, though, because based, it's based on surveys that place those numbers anywhere from 46% to 52%, depending on what counts as a game and who counts as a woman. The video game industry is also so male dominated, 22% comprised of women, but also that statistic is complicated because it is um, a bit dated and it includes people in non-design jobs like human resources, say. Because of all of these things, the fact that roughly half of all players identify as female is not the perception of what a gaming public actually looks like. So in reality, it doesn't matter who actually plays games, the perception is all that matters. And in turn, about half of all game players don't get to count. They don't get to decide what games are important. They don't get to vo vo a voice in the future of the industry. And this particularly applies to those who don't play console-based games of a specific sort. We have a long, robust history of video games being made for a specific specialized audience. And those moments when the industry does seek out more diverse audiences often is done in really nuanced and distilled ways. So was it always like this? The simple answer is not really. Early video games were relatively gender neutral and were meant as entertainment for all, although we can see hints of gender bias pretty early on. Because of a variety of socio-industrial factors, however, that began to shift by the mid-1980s. In her book, Car uh, Coin Operated Americans, Rebooting Boyhood at the Video Game Arcade, Carly Kosarek explores the roots of how and when video games became gendered practices. To this point, the industry really began to lean in and specifically market games to men and boys by the mid-1980s and became a mainstay of boy culture by the mid-1990s. So basically, video games were not always constructed for gendered audiences, but once they became so, it was hard to push back against the notion that video games had always been meant for an audience of men and boys. There were, of course, outlier moments, like in the 1990s when Barbie Fashion Designer became briefly a hit, but Barbie Fashion Designer qualified more as software than a game. It was a way to make clothing for Barbie dolls. And before that, somewhat infamously, in the 1980s, there was apparently a proposal for the Nintendo Knitting Machine, pictured here, now you're knitting with power, that never ended up actually getting made for mass audiences, but was intended to entice girls to play with the Nintendo Entertainment System. And of course, a lot of girls did play with the Nintendo Entertainment System and game systems before that, but they were largely an invisible audience that was rarely considered a primary market. But by the late 1990s and early 2000s, there began to be a mild shift and more attempts to get girls in the game, so to speak. Research started to illustrate that girls with an interest in video games were more likely to enter STEM careers. Several studies and initiatives began to suggest how game design might be an easy fix for this problem. My image here is from Purple Moon Games, a popular series from the late 1990s that um, led to many of these efforts. Um, and after a time, several researchers, myself included, became interested in women in games, studying some of the barriers to entry in getting women to play more video games and why we should care. And suddenly, more video games did start getting designed and marketed uh, to women players. Specifically, in the early 2000s, an increasing number of what are commonly referred to as casual games, a term that I'll break down in a moment, started to be designed deliberately for women audiences. Casual games are generally considered games that are cheap or free, can be played for longer or shorter amounts of time, and are easy to learn. Their general accessibility meant that they became the entry point for a deluge of new players during that time period, and many of those players were women, um, playing hidden object games and time management games on lower-powered computers. Casual games commonly sit 
in a point of opposition to what are often referred to as hardcore games, games that are played on consoles or higher powered computers for longer periods of time and require both higher gaming skill sets and more money. While the terms hardcore and casual are very easily critiquable, they also create a baseline for the transition that occurred during that time period. They created a pecking order of big games versus little games, games that matter versus games that matter less. As video game technologies continue to advance with the release of Nintendo's DS Lite and Wii, as well as the popularity of smartphones, video games became a more robust medium meant to appeal to broader audiences. So to remind you of the statistic I cited earlier, about half of all people who play video games identify as female. But other surveys show that while 49% of adults play video games, only 10% consider themselves gamers. This idea of the gamer really clarifies the disconnect between casual and hardcore and the percentage of the market that the hardcore fully serves. And while casual games have risen in popularity, they have also been made fun of by the larger gaming public. The boundaries of hardcore versus casual is a litmus test determining who does and does not belong in the video game industry, creating this false sense of politics who, of who is entitled to play and who is entitled to have an opinion about what matters within that industry. In 2014, we saw the rise of Gamergate as an official moment when masculine game players felt galvanized enough to argue that video game culture belonged to them. Those who were part of Gamergate in turn harassed women players and industry professionals with violent hate speech, often threatening them online and offline. So uh, here's an example of the filthy casuals meme meant to suggest that casual games are ruining the video game industry and specifically targeting women and girl players. So that was the context in which I wrote Ready Player Two. I wrote a book specifically to highlight video games that were designed for other audiences, non-mainstream audiences. I wrote a book about the filthy casuals, so to speak, about the games that were laughed at by hardcore audiences. I wrote a book about the video games that are often overlooked, but that fund large portions of the industry. I wrote a book about the games that people are often sheepish when they admit that they play. And then following the publication of Ready Player Two in 2017, I experienced something unexpected. I was increasingly approached by women from a variety of backgrounds who confided in me their recent experiences with video games. And these moments were distinct from previous points in my life when strangers and friends, women in particular, spoke to me about my research. In the past, I was told things like, oh, I would never play video games, I don't have time for play. Or, you study video games, they're so violent. Over the last few years, I noticed an abrupt shift. Instead, those same kinds of people approached me about their love for or interest in video games. The things that people said to me in those moments varied, but the most notable were from friends and family members who came back to me after playing a game that I recommended, saying things like, I never knew that games like that existed. You never knew that games like that existed. This comment always was said in reference to artful and literary games such as Monument Valley or Gorgoa, two games that had similarly affected me with their sublime beauty. And it began to occur to me that many audiences, and women audiences in particular, had no idea what video games had become or were capable of becoming. The way that I began to see it was this. There are two types of people out there, people who love video games and people who don't know which video games they love yet. And perhaps this is overly simplistic. I'm aware that there are people out there that don't like any iteration, digital or analog, of a game. But in my experience, most people can find a kind of video game that is satisfying in a way that fills some intense desire for leisure in a way that makes their lives better. But the problem has always been one of information. News outlets, when they talk about video games, talk about negative connotations and salacious stories. We hear about violence, obsessions, addictions, and other unsavory things. We rarely hear about the good, the things that video games bring us. We rarely hear about the artful and literary games which affect public perception of what games are and what they can be. And this, to me, was a feminist concern. This became deeply important to me in, as a feminist issue, how to get more feminists playing video games. Because feminism needs play. Feminisms play, don't play, they, feminisms work and then they work more. Feminist work is occupied with human rights in homes and in offices, with bodies, with technology, with health and with politics. The feminisms of the past have all been inextricably entangled with these matters of gravity and importance. As such, there has been no playtime in feminism. 
And why should there be? Why would a series of serious social movements have the time to concern themselves with the importance of play or playful activism? But it is time for a playful and play-filled feminism. A playful feminism, as I envision it, is a space to advocate for an equality of leisure. Now, video games are part of that, but also part of a broader trajectory of the complex relationship between women and leisure. By leisure here, I'm referring to free, unstructured, non-obligatory time meant to decrease stress and improve lives. And research in leisure studies since the 1980s has demonstrated that there's a gap in leisure equality. This area of research demonstrates that women specifically have long had a complicated relationship with leisure. To this end, women often describe their leisure in terms of productivity. Sociologist Rosemary Deem writes that women's leisure is typically leisure that is cheap or free, can be done in short snippets of time, and made to fill all available time. Oddly, or not so oddly, uh, fitting in with the previous definition that I gave for casual games. And so we see examples of this all the time. Leisure gets marketed in gendered ways, with often productive forms of leisure marketed to feminine audiences and more freeform kinds of leisure marketed to masculine audiences. So back to this original conceit of the section, why do feminists need video games? We need them for two reasons. The first is that, simply put, video games create an opportunity to enact leisure equality. It's a space that has been largely dominated by masculinity until this point, and it is a space where femininity gets largely ignored, harassed, or mocked. A renewed focus on video games creates a new set of opportunities for thinking about leisure equality. The second major reason that we need more feminists playing video games is that playing more video games can help us strategize better. Here, I'm arguing that playing more video games can make us better feminists. Play is an act of resistance, not just about resisting a lack of leisure equality, but using strategies and tactics built into play. In our political fights, we need to learn to game things out better. We need to glitch out the vulnerabilities. We need to mod the game, make a new game, tease out the problems, and find ways to play differently. And no one knows how to better how to glitch out a game than a gamer. By training more feminists to be gamers, we are essentially training them more effectively to think about systems of oppression as structures that can be beaten. So what do I mean when I say play is resistance? It can mean a lot of different things. We can talk about how we can use play to disrupt the status quo through things like alternate reality games or live action role playing games. When we play games, we're embarking on an act of resistance to rethink our situational realities and force us to reconsider the world around us in new terms. These new ways of looking aren't always activist, but they are always a kind of resistance. And to that end, I'm going to break down three different ways that we can use play to think about feminisms. One, through agency, two, through empathy, and three, through community. Cumulatively, these categories can demonstrate the feminist potential of video games, and I'll go through each and give you an example for each. Let's start with agency. Agency is a term used by activists and scholars to articulate the process of taking action, specifically for speaking against systems of power. After all, having a will to act and call out power is the essence of how we can redefine the status quo of hegemonic power structures. And as it happens, agency is also a term that we think about a lot in video game design. Agency in a video game is our will to act, to become part of a game system while also pushing back against it. Without player agency, without that will to act, the player will always lose the game. In the real world, we need to feel our agency to affect change, and thinking about games can help us get there. Because video games are agentic training machines, when we play a game, we're exerting our agency in an unequal system, pushing our power to its limits. Playing video games teaches us how to find that agency, and I would argue exerting agency in a game world can help us to teach us how to exert more agency in the real world. The example that I want to give of the agentic potential of games is from the game series Life is Strange. In Life is Strange, the player controls the life of Max Caulfield, a young woman in high school dealing with a series of both personal and supernatural crises. Toward the latter, the player is given the power to replay moments in Max's life. At points when choices are given to the player, the player may choose to revisit a moment and replay making new and presumably better life choices. But of course, the reason why Life is Strange is successful at a coming-of-age story is not because it's a flatly told narrative, but because it's a game. It provides a space where the audience is not passive, but playing an important part in the retelling of that story. 
The rewind button not only forces the player to think about reflection, but gives the player an active opportunity to reflect. It fosters player agency. Video games are agentic training machines because they teach us skills in safe spaces, remind us of our will to act, and then give us purpose to reflect on those actions afterwards. Additionally, video games are unique for their affective potential. Emo the emotional affect and ability to create bridges of empathy is one of the things video games do uniquely well compared to other media. A video game is a kind of text, and like any text, it has the narrative possibilities to affect, alienate, or subsume its audience into the story. The emotional potential of video games can provide a resonating kind of depth that is capable of enrapturing audiences or even more powerfully, um, just as, or even more powerfully than any other medium. As we play things, we feel things, we become things and rethink things. There's nothing more feminist than this. Playing more games helps us create an empathy bond with the characters outside of ourselves. In the game Oxenfree, the player takes on the role of Alex, a teenager whose brother died before the story started. The game begins with her and her friends interacting on a deserted and haunted island um, alongside her new stepbrother, Jonas. The game's story is an interactive narrative to an extent. The primary acts and plot points of the story remain the same, but the distinctions in how the player experiences the story all relate to affect. If the player is mean to Jonas or her friends or ignore them entirely, the game results in different outcomes than if they are kind. This results in different endings and outcomes for herself, for her friends, and the ghosts that haunt them. The finales, all of them, relate back to empathy that we have towards Alex and that empathy that Alex has towards others. While the story itself is supernatural, the experiences that we have while playing through it are all quite relatable and realistic. The game forces us to think about the inner worlds of others and find ways to evade encroaching supernatural forces while doing so. Finally, I wanted to mention how play engenders community. We're at an odd moment here in 2021, and the world is, in a word, weird. Many of us are isolated and feel the despair of that isolation, and we need to feel the camaraderie of other human beings. We need more opportunities for community building and time in a place that meeting in person to work together and to conspire together, to resist together, has become difficult. Video games can provide another vehicle for us to build community virtually. Additionally, the act of playing a game together creates a common set of rules and boundaries that are alternate from real life. The most obvious example here is the hot game of the moment, Among Us. Among Us, for those of you who haven't heard of it recently, um, is a social deduction game where players group together and decide who among them is a traitor. Among Us was initially released in 2018, but it didn't become a hit until COVID times because now is the moment that we all need games to give us more of a sense of community and help us play together from a distance. Games can create specific instances and opportunities where we can galvanize, coordinate, and resist together. So circling back to the question that I asked at the beginning of this talk, why do feminists need video games? We need to play more games because by playing games, by getting more people to play, by thinking about structural systems, gaming them out, finding vulnerabilities, and then finding playful ways to combat those vulnerabilities, that is how we win. That is how we make the world better. I might argue that some of the reasons why movements like Gamergate were so successful at their campaigns is that they were movements made up of game players who knew how to work exploits of a system. At the same time, we can use the agentic and empathy building mechanisms already inherent in video games to allow us to see things differently, to understand the world from other perspectives and gain the agency to think about how to make structural change. I began this presentation by asserting what to me seemed like an obvious point, that video games need to matter to feminists. However, I'm here also to argue the reverse point as well, that feminism needs to matter more to video games, but the industry at large and those individuals beholden by the industry. This might feel counterintuitive. To some extent, the video game industry has been at odds with feminism in a variety of ways for some years, whether it's in critique of the absurdly proportioned Lara Croft or in response to the toxicity promoted within Gamergate. Yet, to think about feminism and video games at odds with one another is wrong-headed. Earlier in this talk, I spoke about th this idea of the video game industry designed for an idealized masculine player, um, which is typically depicted as masculine, white, heterosexual, cisgendered, enabled. Um, this core market has served as a, a portion of the industry marginally well. It, it 
resulted in innovation, but innovation for one specific big bucket sector, hardcore AAA games. Innovation tends to serve the sector over and over again, making graphics better, and processor speed faster with the same kinds of games. But the focus of appealing to that singular market also limits innovation of the industry. Video games as a format and a medium are in a need of a creative platform expanding metaphysical explosion. There are ruts and assumptions that have for so long ruled how things are done. By appealing to a singular audience or a few core audiences, we are missing opportunities for innovation, creativity, and a dramatic overhaul of how we think about games and play. So then the question becomes, if we rethink some of the underlying philosophies of video games, if we invite in new ideological premises that are meant to destabilize and disrupt, what might video games look like? To my mind, they can only look better. Video game audiences have already begun to diversify. In recent years, it has been, ironically, the occurrences surrounding Gamergate that has made the presence of feminist gamers obvious. The gamer, uh, Gamergate has galvanized many of the disenfranchised voices that had been engaging in game culture, both um, quietly and not so quietly, for decades now. But even more importantly, an increasing number of feminists are also en route to becoming gamers. The medium of video games is still young, and the market is still figuring itself out. While it may have previously been acceptable to appeal solely to niche masculine markets, this is no longer going to remain a viable business plan. As the medium continues to grow up, diversity is a glorious inevitability, and one that the industry should wholeheartedly embrace. But there's more at play in why feminism should matter to video games than simply expanding the market. Thinking about feminism can make video games better. And we've already seen some of this change. While not all women are feminists and not all feminists are women, the shifting demographics of the video game industry illustrate that new technologies, new audiences, and new ways of thinking about what a video game can be have only helped to push the medium. Earlier in this talk, I referenced statistics that only 22% of the industry identified as female. But what's remarkable about this number is the dramatic speed that it got to that number. In 2009, the video game industry was composed of only 11% women, and that number doubled to 22% by 2014. In that time, we have seen an explosion of new kinds of games and gaming, and some of this, of course, is due to rapid technological developments, yet technology can only revolutionize so much. And I would argue that the truly innovative and artful video games that we've seen in the past decade are due to the slow but steady diversification of who is making video games. Video games need feminism just as much as feminism needs video games. So what happens if we imagine audiences differently? What happens if we pull in new audiences who are still figuring out what they might like to play and how they might want to play it? What happens if rather than assuming that video games are just for your high school brother or your middle-aged dad, we start thinking about games for your grandmother or working moms or genderqueer teens? What happens if we stop deciding the specific identity of who gets to play altogether and make more games for more people? All of a sudden, we serve two purposes, innovating content and structure of what we're making and also encouraging leisure equality. And at the same time, we are, as I already noted, providing new tools for thinking about resistance. In short, I'm here to tell you now, to tell you here at Imagining Futures that you need to play more. If you are someone who likes video games, find new kinds of games to challenge yourself. If you're someone who's game curious, find recommendations. If you previously thought that you didn't want to play games, consider the possibility that you just haven't found the right ones yet. And if you're someone who's already a heavy game player, go find more people in your lives that aren't getting enough leisure and play and help them to play more. Become a play evangelist. Get everyone you know, your parents, your kids, your coworkers, your friends, your allies to play more games because it will make us better humans and better feminists. And if more of us play more games, we will make games better. Thank you so much for coming to this talk and I genuinely am looking forward to your questions.